Today I have the honor of interviewing two-time Grammy-nominated classical guitarist Berta Rojas. This is a release of her iconic album, Intimate Barrios. She has never stopped breaking new ground. From exploring Latin American music on Cielo Abierto and collaborating with other musical giants. In 2011, she released Dia y Medio with 11-time uh, Grammy Award winner Paquito de Rivera. And in 2015, Historia del Tango, where she explored uh, Argentine tango music. And in 2017, Felicidade with Gilberto Gil, Tokino, and Ivan Lins. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, thank you for participating in this interview. Thank you so much, and, and thank you for that. You know, it brings so many memories to me. Sometimes you are working constantly, and, and you don't think back about all the things that, that you have done in your life. Mm -hmm. And all of those memories with those CDs that you mentioned are happy memories for me. Well, they're also amazing because you haven't gone the traditional route of like, I'm going to record an Albeni and Granados album. I'm going to go ahead and do a Torroba mm -hmm. album. You, you're, you're, you're reaching out, you're expanding the Latin, Latin American repertoire. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just amazing. Oh, and, thank you and so much. It's not boring. It's like, <laughs> we're like, what, what is she going to do next? You know? <laughs> so. And you know, it, it, it puzzles me also. Well, what am I going to do next? Because you know? I am thinking a lot and listening a lot and, and feeling a lot. Because I do travel quite a bit through Latin America and there are so many beautiful things that I would love to record. Uh, so many genres that I haven't explored. And so I really don't know what to do. It's like so much that is open uh, and, and available to us. I want to talk about your education. I don't think that there's ever been in history a musician who's had such a academic pedigree mm -hmm. as you. You've had eight teachers. Some of them are mm -hmm. Carlos Vázquez, Felipe Sosa, Violeta Mestrada, and you studied piano with uh, Rosa Mereles de López. But then again, you've got the three musical giants, Latin American musical giants, Abel Carlevaro, who doesn't get as much credit as he does because uh, a lot of people think that Scott Tennant is the person who invented or um, sequential planting and planting, but he originally got it from Carlevaro's books where Carlevaro is the first person to mention anything about planting. Mm -hmm. And uh, Eduardo Fernandez, who was also a student of Carlevaro, and then with Manuel Barreco, you got your Master's of Music from Peabody Institute. Mm -hmm. So. Oh my God, like, I think that they were giants uh, in every sense of the world. Uh, people that had tremendous uh, insight into music, but that also had uh, values to transmit that very much uh, I think ignited the, the thirst for, for exploring. You know? Carlevaro was always inventing something. He would come to, I would go to, to his house for lessons and every time I saw him he had something new, something new to show me that he had invented, uh, support for his guitar, a, a new footstool, a new composition, always exploring. You know? Eduardo Fernandez was a, a, a person that, that was reading and writing new music all the time. Uh, Manuel Barreco is a, is a musician that explores new avenues of interpretation. So these are people that, that are highly innovative, I believe. Uh, and I, I am really thankful for, uh, to them for everything that they have given me. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, wow, and, and they, Manuel Barreco also has explored other music as well, and, and um, like uh, he's been, he released an album of Beatles music, he released uh, an album of, of Cuban music where there was some Brower, but there's also some other composers that are not as well known. Mm. Um, are you familiar with... Um, Luis Malca Contreras? Mm, unfortunately not. 
he's a Peruvian guitarist, mm -hmm. and I had the um, I had the amazing experience of going to one of his concerts recently, and he was playing Peruvian music. He was uh, playing music by Pedro Jiménez Abril Tirado, Máximo Puente Arnau, and Matías Maestro. It was music from the late 19th century that isn't, you know, just like Barrios music. They were just like not well known. They're, they're a couple of years behind, obviously, because since what, the late 70s, with John Williams playing Barrios music, it's become more more out there, more. It's the Barrios music. Barrios music has become more well known over the past few years, but there's other people like yourself exploring new music that, that is, has been unheard of. Um, Pedro Chimenez Abril Tirado had some minuets, and I was, in the, I was there looking at the uh, program while I was hearing music. I was like, wow, this sounds like top shelf Fernando Sor music. And it was from Peru, so it's, it's, it's amazing what's out there. And, uh, and also uh, Iliana Matos. Yeah. She lived here in Spain for in Barcelona for many years. And amazing she, guitar. She's amazing and she's playing the music of Eduardo Martin. So yeah. I think it's amazing that there's people like you guys out there, you know, championing playing. Championing this music. No? Championing this music and, and showing it to the world, educating people that it's not just music, you know, from, from Europe. We, there's great Latin American composers as well. Mm. So, uh, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? You know, I was uh, today in a master class with some, some students that attended, and we were talking about living the music. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, to do the, the tango album, I went and spent some time in Argentina mm -hmm. and played with the guys. And Latin American music, as probably every music in the world that has a, a popular background, um, needs to be lived, right? needs to be danced, needs, needs to be sung, the rhythm, you have to feel it. And today when the students were uh, tapping the rhythm, accompanying, doing the strumming uh, with the right hand, which in a way has the the, 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 our countries in it, right? Because with the, with the strumming, you learn patterns that belong to the folk music of our country. Right? Uh, and the universe is in, in our left hand, right? Because mm -hmm. this is common to, to every culture, you know, except for the nuances, right? But the right hand has many, many secrets. So the more you leave uh, this music in Latin America, the more it opens up to you. So I would encourage uh, people that approach this, this music to, if you can, to do that. To go online, search for it, listen to this music that is alive, being played. If you're gonna play a short, go and listen to the shorts that are being played and recorded and lived today uh, in, in Brazil. Or uh, if you're gonna play a tango, Go and listen to the, to the tango albums that are being recorded by the, by the popular players and the ones that, that know this, this genre. Because it's, 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 it's really different when you leave the music than when you take it from a classical point of view, just going through the score. The score doesn't reflect all the secrets that are embedded in this music. So there's a lot to be done. And uh, that's the fun of it. It never ends. I'd like to talk to you about your guitars. You've yeah. had, well, in history, every famous concert artist has a relationship with a certain guitar maker, sometimes two, like um, Segovia had Ramirez and Hauser one. Uh, Julian Bream had Romanios, Boucher. Uh, John Williams was Smallman. Pepe Romero with, well, the whole Romero family with uh, Miguel Rodriguez. Now they've kind of deviated from that a little bit and now they're playing Pepe Jr. guitars. And, but um, 
Pepe's son, Pepe mm -hmm. Jr. And um, you, you've had a relationship with two guitar makers. You had a, uh, from 1996 to 1998, your main touring guitar was a 1994 Rob, Robert Ruck with a spruce top and Brazilian rosewood back and sides. Cedar top. Oh, sorry, did I say spruce? Cedar top. Sorry, cedar top. Cedar sorry. Top, yeah. Cedar top. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, you, you, you are a fan of cedar top guitars. Mm -hmm. And um, and you used that instrument on your 1998 album, Intimate Barrios. And um, can you tell us about that guitar? Oh, that was a, 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 a guitar that has so much poetry in it. You know? uh, it was a, a delicate sounding instrument. And uh, imagine what it was like for me when I tried it the first time. And, and I was coming from playing a, a low end instrument. You know? And I was visiting the United States on a on a uh, an exchange program for for students, and they would give us some money every day to eat. <laughs> and I was actually eating very little and saving my money, you know. So I ended up saving I don't know enough to pay pretty much I believe three quarters of the instrument. You know? And I attended a festival, and that guitar was being sold, there. and so I bought it. You know? And I couldn't believe that I was able to buy an instrument that beautiful. And then Robert Rock replaced an instrument for me. He gave me another one, uh, which ended up being the instrument that I recorded uh, some albums with. That you know are still in my in my in my heart. Uh, because the sound of that guitar was very, very special. Then later, Michael Aliri appeared. Okay. Hold on a second. Yeah. Um, which one of your Robert Rocks did you use on the you, The one that, that you sold recently, right? Uh, that was the one that you used on your Intimate Bafio album? Yeah, I think so. I think okay. so. Yeah. And um, was Manuel Barreco influential on you in buying a Robert Ruck because I know oh, yeah. that he likes to record oh, yeah. with Robert yeah. Ruck and he's got his dominant. Yes, yes, yes. He was the one that called my attention. You know? So when I saw the Ruck, I said, this is the instrument that Manuel plays. But he wasn't my teacher at the time. I was trying to study with him. And when I saw that instrument and I had the, the opportunity to play it, it really spoke to me and it made me want to be better. It made me want to, to, to become a, a guitarist that could learn as many secrets about the instrument as he, as he could. Tell us about the Michael O'Leary guitar, because you've been playing that. Yeah. You, you, there was a point where your album Intimate Barrios came out in 1998, and then in uh, 2008 you remastered the CD, yeah. and you, were, you changed from playing the Ruck to playing the Michael O'Leary. And there's a bonus track on there, Las Abejas, which I think you played the, the new guitar, yeah, the Michael Leary. Yeah, on the Leary. And uh, when I changed to the, to the Leary, uh, it was in Ireland. I, I had met him, uh, and the guitar had something that, that captured me. Uh, it's an instrument that, that, on top of being a, a beautiful instrument uh, and having the, the, the beauty of sound it has, it also has a projection that I very much needed for concerts. I'm not saying that the rubber rack doesn't project as much because it's, it's, it's a different quality of sound completely. Uh, so I, I said maybe it's time to try. This, this is and I ended up uh, uh, changing to to my O'Leary, which has been my instrument. I I am very loyal, and it was hard for me to do that, that change. Uh, but I decided to go for it, and, and that's the guitar that has been with me since then. Um, I was talking to David Russell, I interviewed him a couple days ago, 
and he was telling me that he has one too and he likes it very much so mm -hmm. so I, I guess that's going to be like you're going to be influencing a lot of people in the future to actually play Michael Larry guitars just like people are playing Smallman because of John Williams and people are playing Damon because of Manuel Barroico and because of David Russell. So well, thank you for thank you, know, you for that. Thank you for that. I hope so because uh, you know uh, to find an instrument defines your voice. Mm -hmm. right? So you ha you have to play the instrument that speaks to your heart, mm -hmm. uh, or else you can't honor the instrument. Mm -hmm. uh, Atahualpa Yupanqui used to say that uh, the wood, no music, well, what. Well, long before it was a guitar oh. because it had birds singing on it, right? So it knew it, the, the, the wood knew music long before becoming an instrument, right? Uh, so our job is to continue singing like birds did on, on the piece of wood, right? Yes. And we have to find the, the instrument that, that projects our voice the better, the best and, and we try to honor it. Yeah. It's That's a difficult, very difficult choice. You know, every time it is. You're on your second, right? Your second no, lyric? it's my third. It's your third. Because you had third. one that was ruined in a plane accident. Or uh, but that's the one I play. That's your concert, that's, that's your main concert instrument. Still, it needs to beat up, and I still love it. <laughs> you know, I still love it. It's my, it's my, my baby, you know. You want to see it? It's, Yes. Uh, Look at it. <laughs> oh, it's, it's okay here. Is that I'm I'm scared of it hitting on the. <laughs> no, 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 that's okay. Yeah. So you see, it shows the work. You know, it shows the work. It shows the time. You know. But this. It's got some dense, but, oh, but, yeah. but it sounds it amazing. It has been with me since 2008, you know, and so it has the, the marks of, of a guitar that has traveled quite a bit. <laughs> How would you describe the tone for yourself? Because like... The, uh, tone, the tone, I think, is a, is a warm tone that projects, speaks. Uh, I think that it has a flexibility to adapt to what you want with it. It can it can be a it can be a, an instrument with uh, solo pianos if you want, or or it can deliver a a, a, a powerful tone if you need. Or it can be. So it can it can do so many things, and I believe that it's vibrato is so beautiful. Or right, so it's it's, it's a beautiful instrument. Wow, <laughs> it's beautiful and amazing sound. Um, Actually, since we're here with you, got the guitar. This is perfect. <laughs> I, I have some questions. Um, in Spanish music, there's like the Spanish triplet, mm -hmm. and usually, like in the the piece La Paloma um, by Iradier, when you hear non-Spaniards play it, they play the triplet straight. But when you hear like Pepe Romero or Angel Romero. They know how to play the, the, the triplet because they know the Spanish music. And uh, when you play, for example, because you know you're you're an expert, you're the world expert on barrios. When you play pieces like Julia Florida, which, uh, which is a uh, barcarola in English, is a barcarola. 
you play with a bit more rubato. It's like you're thinking more in terms of phrases and you're telling a story. And uh, you play very naturally like you wrote it. Mm -hmm. And almost it's like an improvisation that's mm -hmm. just, just flowing from you. You know, Villalobos used to say that a recording is a moment. Mm -hmm. Um, he said that uh, who wants to listen to that moment over and over again, he said, no? And I often think about that because I really don't remember very well what I did on that day. I just know that probably the, the recording studio was in darkness and, and, and that I just went for it. And, and I just try to sing from the bottom of my heart, and that's what came up. Uh, but if I have to play today for you, I don't know what I would do with it, yeah. you know? Uh, and probably that's the beauty of, of uh, performing live, yeah. that you have the opportunity to recreate a piece. It won't always sound the same, but as long as it's true to your heart, then, no, but I, I wonder about how much of that is that, like, of knowing the music. And because when you hear other people play it in, in recordings or, or live, they tend to play it more straight, more true to the meter, like they're, like they're waltzing it. When you play it, it's not like a waltz. There's, there's like a little swing. That, listen, that's, listen to this. If you yes. think about... What's your advice for people wanting to play barrios appropriately? appropriately like, uh, you know, the word appropriately, I'm not sure that it uh, that applies to, to music. I think that music is like a, like a canvas in which you would throw your colors and, and you would create something new every time you approach. If you come from, a, from an open, from an openness mm -hmm. of your soul and of your heart. Uh, so what is appropriate is what your heart feels with the music. I can't transfer what I feel and I don't think it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's just true to your heart and to your soul. So honesty probably is a, is is a is a word that I would like to use when when I, I try to think about a piece that I that I want to play. You know? mm -hmm. I try to be honest to what I feel, no matter if it's correct or not for for the judgment of, of other people. Because you're the artist. Because you are the artist, and that's our job. You know, our job is is to to leave your voice to the music. Uh, from a, a point of view of, of, of somebody who is honest and, and true to their feelings. So that's what we look for as, as performers. Wow. Thank you for that. It's beautiful hearing you play. About your strings, um, 
you were talking about earlier about finding your voice with the instrument and, and being an artist and right now about playing about how you feel and projecting that to the audience. How much does strings matter to to that to your voice? Because I mean, there's so many options for people. There's nylon, which I, I, I tend to gravitate more toward nylon because I feel it's warmer. And then there's carbon, which is brighter, and, and, and uh, titanium. Can you tell us about your strings and how you how you find the strings that are that are more appropriate to your touch? I told you before that I that I am loyal. Yes. And uh, it's hard for me to change, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have been using carbon for for a few years now, and I I am happy with the sound I get on, on the guitar with them, you know. So I am using normal carbon on the top three, and I'm using uh, Cantilla Savares is my strength on the on the bottom. And I, I like it. Maybe I should try more. And discover other new strings, but so far so good. <laughs> Are they? Do you, do you? What about tension? Do you? Do you prefer like a normal. hard tension, normal tension? Yeah, normal for the for the top three, and I use hard for the lower strings. And th did you use that also with your Robert rack? Was that with my rack? I I use a I used to use a Dario in those days, and I use the J forty five. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. That's mm -hmm. so you change guitars and you change strings too. <laughs> also, you know, yeah, that's true. Yeah. I used briefly the Dario also on this instrument, and then I changed to Savares, and I've been happy with them ever since. Are these the the new ones, the new bass strings that they have, the the Cantiga? Because they have they have the regular Cantiga, yes. and then they have they have like a newer Cantiga that's been they've been experimenting with lately. Yeah, they are gonna send me that, but I have. I hear. Now Polish, sorry. Now. <laughs> uh, amazing. Um, what advice you? Well, you do master classes all over the world. Like you just did one earlier today. What advice would you give to somebody preparing for a master class? Because sometimes they can get really nervous because they're next to such you know an amazing person like you or David Russell or Manuel Barroico. What advice would you give to somebody preparing for a master? To play something that, that is easy enough for you so that you enjoy it. That's it. Uh, you don't have to play anything. You have to want to play something. Thank you so much for My pleasure. this interview. My pleasure. Thank you My so pleasure. much. Thank you so much. It was beautiful to talk to you. Thank you. It was great talking to you, too. <laughs> Thanks. Yes, I <Yeah>. No. <laughs>